Lesson nine, Kingdom Living Lesson nine, our theme verse. Colossians 1.13, this time we're out of the Living Bible. For he has rescued us out of the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom and has brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. So it went out of darkness and gloom and then into the kingdom of his dear son. Do you see that this is suggesting that there are some contrasts between those two identities, between those two realities? On one hand, you have darkness and gloom. And then on the other hand, all it says is the kingdom of his dear son. But there's an implied contrast between these two things. You either were this, but you're now this. And if you are this, then you're not this anymore. One or the other. Let's talk for a second about what is the opposite of darkness. Light, okay? Any other thoughts about what the opposite of darkness is? Versus evil. Say it again. Good versus, evil. Good versus evil. Okay. You can use darkness in that context. I went to the dictionary and started looking for the antonyms of darkness with all the different definitions of darkness. And here are some of the ones that I found were very interesting. You said light. Okay. We did that already. Visibility. In darkness, it's hard to see. Openness. Things that are done in darkness are usually want to be kept secret. They're not open, they're, they're hidden. So one, one opposite would be openness, forthrightness. Have you ever been dark about a subject, meaning it wasn't clear? It wasn't, it, it wasn't, you weren't certain about what this meant. It was ambiguous. So forthrightness, clarity, comprehensibility, straightforwardness, certainty, radiance, brightness any other thoughts about opposites of darkness i thought there was a pretty good list covering some some different aspects and some different contexts i would say darkness would be the kingdom of the enemy yes yes be yes so on one hand we were delivered out of darkness and now we're in the kingdom of light so we should be experiencing on a regular basis all these things that are the opposites of darkness our walk our christian experience our kingdom life should reflect all of these opposite things to darkness we shouldn't have the darkness components at all we shouldn't go back to it We should not ever, and especially not the majority of the time, experience those components of darkness. If we are, then we keep going back and forth between the two kingdoms. There's some thought processes. There's some patterns. There's some concepts that we brought with us out of that old life into this new system that are not compatible with the new system. Okay, uh, darkness and gloom. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his dear son should be opposite of gloom. What words would you define as being the opposite of gloom? Right. Don't all speak at once. Hmm? What is the opposite of gloom? Joy, okay. What else? Hope, okay. Love, all right. Uh, from the dictionary, the antonyms for gloom, uh, we said joy, happiness, bliss. How about this? Humor. <laughs> Confidence, okay. Uh, rapture, I thought that was a good antonym for uh, gloom. Optimism. Contentment. Delight, satisfaction, beam. You're beaming rather than you're gloomy. Uh, smile. That seems very simple. But how often do we miss that simple thing? If our character was defined by all of these things, would we more readily identify with the kingdom that we've been supposedly delivered from or the kingdom that we're supposedly in now? Um, grin, cheerfulness. Once again, we should be experiencing these things most of the time, if not all of the time. 
to be a true citizen, a true person with understanding inside the kingdom of God, inside the kingdom of light, inside the kingdom of visitor son. If we were to evaluate ourselves, do any of these characteristics do identify with either the darkness or the good more times than the other? If you were to be judged on which kingdom you were in, internally and then by your your friends, your spouse, your uh, kids, the people you spend time around, which kingdom would they say that you're in? By the way that you act most of the time. By which one of these things, by which one of these attributes predominates your being? Okay, Matthew 18, 1 through 6. This is from the Amplified Classic. At that time, the disciples came up and asked Jesus, who then is really the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who then is really the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Have you ever thought about that question? Or have you just read that and kind of went on when in your reading and, oh, I'm not really paying attention to that. I don't really care. The disciples were apparently very upset, very bothered, very interested in the answer to this question. Who's the greatest? In the kingdom. Today we're going to spend some time answering this question. The greatest in the kingdom. The greatest in the kingdom. Let's continue reading that passage. Matthew 18, 1 through 6. At that time, the disciples came up and asked Jesus, who then really is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a little child to himself and put him in the midst of them and said, truly, I say to you, Unless you repent, change, turn around, turn about, and become like little children, trusting, lowly, loving, forgiving, you can never enter the kingdom of heaven at all. Whoever will humble himself, therefore, and become like this little child, trusting, lowly, loving, forgiving, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives and accepts and welcomes one little child like this for my sake and in my name receives and accepts and welcomes me. But whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in and acknowledge and cleave to me to stumble and sin, that is, who entices him or hinders him in the right conduct or thought, it would be better, more expedient, more profitable or advantageous for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be sunk in the depth of the sea. That's pretty strong. It would be better for that guy that cause these little ones to not force them to be something other than who they are. It would be better for that person to have a millstone hung around his neck and be cast into the lake, cast into the sea. Now, what's going to happen if you've got a millstone around your neck? You're going to drown. I mean, this sounds like mob execution style with the concrete swimming shoes. And that's exactly what he's talking about. Not that somebody's going to kill him, but from my point of view, from God's point of view, it would be better if you decided to do that to yourself or somebody did that to you than for you to mess with these little kids. And yet we've got a whole society now that don't even fear at all about messing with little kids. We have messed this thing up totally. And I don't want to talk about that part of it today, but I do want to talk about what was the answer to the question? Who's the greatest in the kingdom? The little child. The little child. So if we want to be great in the kingdom of God, we've got to think about what characteristics of a little child have we lost that we need to re-implement, that we need to return to, that we need to come back to. And that'll be one of them, and, and we'll, we'll talk more in detail in just a moment. Before we get into this more deeply, why do you think the disciples asked Jesus the question, who's the greatest in the kingdom? <laughs> they were, yes. Which one of them was going to be the big dog yeah. oh, so they in the kingdom? They didn't yet, oh, okay. but they know that Jesus is coming to set this kingdom up. So they're his team. They're the people spending all this time with him. So when he finally sets this thing up and he says, okay, here's, here's a start button. We're going to go. 
The kingdom is now official. The kingdom is now open. The kingdom is now launched. Who's in charge? Obviously, Jesus is going to be in charge, but they've already heard him start talking about, I'm not going to be here very long. So once he turns the kingdom on, and then he leaves, now who's in charge? Do you see this debate, this positioning, this jockeying, this vying for position from the disciples? They wanted to know the criteria for the upcoming contest to see who would be number one in the kingdom. Okay, Jesus, how are you going to make your decision about who's the top dog? Jesus totally messed them up with his answer. He calls for a little or a small child to join them in their circle. It is important to see that. This was not just a child, but a little child, a small child. This kid was likely just walking. So he's two, three, four years old, maybe. Four years old might even be pushing it, but two, three years old. And this kid was the model that Jesus chose of who is great in the kingdom. Why did he choose him? What about that kid should we emulate? What about that kid should we think about? What about that kid should we follow in order for us? And I'm not saying our pursuit is to be great in the kingdom, but our pursuit has got to be at least to be effective in the kingdom. And Jesus says, you're not even going to enter it unless you convert, unless you be changed, go back to this little child, this small child. So if, there's, if we are interested in operating in the kingdom of heaven, this says there's something that we must do. What is that something? We must become like little children. Yeah, all of those things, yes. We're going to talk about them in more detail in just a moment. But you're getting the idea of there are some characteristics of a little child that we have got to go back to in order for us to enter the kingdom, participate in the kingdom, and then to consequentially be great in the kingdom. Good. Living by faith, simple trust. Uh, again, one of the concepts of this kid. So that, that's what we're going to spend the next few minutes is talking about what do children have, little children have, that we might have lost in our journey toward adulthood that we might need to revisit. With the end being, okay, I'm going to get in the kingdom, I'm going to operate in the kingdom, and in God's perspective, I'm going to be great in the kingdom because I have chosen to become like a little child. Were you going to say something? Yeah. I'm going to focus more on the, the characteristics of childhood that we think we outgrow when we grow up. Things that we think are part of the maturation process that are actually advantageous when they're not advantageous at all. Things that we need to return. Yeah. Yes, yes. You're catching the idea. Let's, let's, let's actually talk through some of the characteristics that we can see in this text and then some other things about children that we need to learn from, that we need to go back to. On the very, very when you realize that and turn around and receive Christ, they say you must be born again. Born again, again right. And that's a spiritual that's rebirth. The that, that is a spiritual thing. That's not a physical thing. This is more emotional. This is more, uh, not even mental, but the, this is more like the personality stuff. This is more the way you carry yourself, the way you operate. And we've got this definition that as an adult, I'm supposed to do this a certain way. And Jesus is saying, as an adult, you need to become like a kid again. Okay, here we go. Let's read verse 3 from some different versions and see if we can get some insight here. Matthew 18, 3. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, unless you repent, that is, change your inner self, your old way of thinking, change lot, live, change lives. Okay, wait a minute. He said repent. So us not doing this is sin? God views us not getting a grasp about this as sin. Otherwise, we wouldn't need to repent. We wouldn't need to change. We wouldn't need to go back and redo something differently. And repent, he means change your inner self, your old way of thinking. Live a changed life. Unless you repent, do all those things, and become like little children, trusting, humble, 
forgiving, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Not that you won't have a good time in the kingdom of heaven. Not that you won't be productive. You didn't get to go. You didn't get to be part of it. So if you want to be part of this, here is something that you must do. Become, turn, change like a little child. Then he said, I tell you the truth, you must change or turn from your sins, convert and turn. Become like little children. Otherwise, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm telling you the truth, he said, unless you turn inside out and become like children, you will never, ever get into the kingdom of heaven. He said, I tell you the truth, if your hearts do not change and become like hearts of children, you will never go into the kingdom of heaven. A couple more. I tell you the truth and said, truly, I say to you, but be ye turned and be made as little children. You shall not enter to the kingdom of heavens. Assuredly, I'm saying to you, unless you reverse your present trend of thought and become as little children, in no case shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. Do we have some work to do? Do we need to think about these characteristics of little children and make some adjustments as adults to go back that direction in order to have success in the kingdom? Do you think this was Jesus? Do you think Jesus was serious about this? Would he have mentioned it if it weren't possible to actually do it? Would he have said, okay, guys, here's what you need to do. Now, now mind you, I'm not going to help you. Mind you, I'm not going to give you the ability to make this change, but here's what you need to do. Does that sound fair? Does that sound like something that God would do? That's a religious idea. Here's what you need to change. And, and by the way, you're on your own. God never does that. He always gives us an ability. He gives us the option. He gives us assistance to help us do all the things that he's asking us to do. Can I go back to being a physical baby and grow up again? Is that within the realm of possibility? It's not. So what am I supposed to do with this? My mentality, my thinking, the goals, the motivations, the, the things that we view as admirable, the things that we view as true marks of maturity and as a, a adulthood, maybe we need to reevaluate which ones of those are actually true statements of maturity, true statements of growth, and possibly consider it from the lens of we're supposed to become, we're supposed to change and become like little children. What does this mean? How am I supposed to do this? The Greek word here is strepno. It's G4762, if you want to look it up. It means to turn, turn around, turn oneself of one who no longer cares for another, to turn oneself from one's course of conduct, to change one's mind. It seems that we need to make some adjustments. Let's read another verse for a framework before we dive in here. So we're, we're hopefully in agreement now that there's some things we need to adjust. There's some things we need to reevaluate. Let's see what a framework for that might be so that we get a better clue of what we're actually supposed to be changing. 1 Corinthians 14, 20. 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Brothers and sisters, do not be children, immature, childlike in your thinking. Be infants in matters of evil completely innocent and inexperienced, but in your minds, be mature adults. Christian brothers, do not be like children in your thinking. Be full grown, but be like children in knowing, I'm sorry, in not knowing how to sin. My brothers, do not be like children in your thinking. When it comes to doing wrong things, be like small babies, but in your thinking, be grown up people. So what's Paul saying? How is he complimenting this idea that we're supposed to go back to this state of little children? It's not small-mindedness. It's not, I've got to go back and unlearn all this stuff. It's be innocent with regards to evil. Be innocent with regards to sin. Be innocent with regards to things that are wrong, that we have accepted as being right just because that was part of growing up. You'll see that more clearly in just a second. Here's one more version of that. To be perfectly frank, I'm getting exasperated with your childish thinking. How long before you grow up and use your head? 
your adult head. It's all right to have childlike unfamiliarity with evil. A simple no is all that's needed there, but it's far more to saying yes to something. Only mature and well-exercised intelligence can save you from falling into gullibility. I don't want to be gullible. And Jesus is not saying you got to go back and, like a little child, be totally gullible about things. He's not saying you should think through things clearly. He's not saying that you shouldn't have developed your intelligence and your logic and have more experience. What he is saying is there are some characteristics that your experience will water down over time. There are some attributes that as you go through life, those tend to go away and they shouldn't have. We shouldn't have allowed them to go away. We shouldn't have uh, placed an emphasis on them going away. We should have seen those as, okay, this is still desirable, even though I'm growing up. Because my priorities are all jacked up. My understanding is all messed up. So I need to reframe what I value as being good, what I value as being the goal, what I value as being the target, and then make some adjustments in order to get to this new target, which is returning to those childlike states in some characteristics. Go ahead. And so this is a question we've been having. So Paul has mentioned before correcting, he said, you know, basically don't use common language. Right. Don't be telling dirty jokes. Right. Um, you know, you're living in the world, you, you learn street, you learn stuff like that. And children don't know that. So is that kind of like what that's that's one about? of the things he's talking about, yes. As we grow up, we become more cynical. We become more unbelieving, untrusting in the world. And, and there's some wisdom to that, so you won't be taken advantage of. But there's also some very bad things in that, too, because our, our worldview is they're trying to cheat me rather than I'm just here to have fun. Correct. Yes. Yes. Well, I like what you said about being innocent to evil and sin. Because, um, you know, you're to call yourself naive or innocent is to, by the world's view, is to kind of call yourself like not being a man. You know what I mean? Yes. I mean, it's, it's, they, they skewed that so much, but, you know, and it's okay to be innocent and naive about certain things. In fact, I remember. Would be. I've, I've corrupted myself for so long that it, I'm trying to regain the innocence is not easy. <laughs> when we grow up, we somehow don't want to be taken advantage of. And that's, that's a good thing to not want to be taken advantage of. But in so doing, we think, okay, I'm going to guard myself against this. And what we do, what we lose in the process is, okay, it doesn't really matter what you do to me. God's greater. God will fix yeah. whatever you're doing to me. And I'm going to love you anyway. I have to love you anyway. Yeah. So rather than me just expecting you to, to treat me badly, I'm like, God, you've got my back. It doesn't really matter if I know you're trying to trick me or not. If I'm supposed to do it, I'm going to do it. The responsibility of that is on you. And I'm not going to allow myself to be condemned, ashamed, or whatever by the world's viewing that as me being gullible or naive or, or whatever. Because the, the act of love in me going there anyway, and me not saying it, and me not doing it, and me not responding is better than to not have ever been tricked or deceived. Or It seems there's some stuff that we've picked up along the path of growing up that we shouldn't have. Maybe we've gotten rid of some things that we should have kept. Little children in the natural haven't made these decisions yet. What can we learn by watching them? Okay, verses three and four, and it depends which verse you're talking about, uh, which ones of these actually work. Let's read a few of them and we'll see where we're at. So this says, become like little children. And then it goes on to say, trusting, humble, and forgiving. Become like little children, trusting, lowly, loving, forgiving. Become simple and elemental again, like this child. So are those some characteristics that we probably need to focus on? Let's start talking about those characteristics of little children that we're going to talk about today. Number one, trusting. Little children will believe anything that you tell them. 
They don't try to figure it out. They don't need 15 confirmations. They just trust. They just believe. Would that be an admirable characteristic for a believer? For you to just trust when God tells you to do something. To not need 15 confirmations about it. To just be so close and so in tune that you just do what he said. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to understand it all. You just simply trust and simply believe and simply move forward with what it is that you have now been instructed to do. Isn't that something that we've lost as we become adulthood? Say it again. Right. Yeah. Yes. We, we have lost the fear. Of the Lord. Exactly. But we think we need more information now as adults. We think, well, I've got to understand how this works. I've got to know how this is going to operate. Really? Says who? And in the process of you trying to figure out how it's going to work, have you ever gotten one of those deals right? I know I haven't. Usually when I conclude, okay, this is how God's going to do this, that's first on the list of the ways he's not going to do it. I don't know if any of your experience bears that out, but that's usually how it works with me. So I might as well not even waste my time trying to figure it out because what I have just determined is, okay, this is how it's not going to happen. Moving right along. Forgiving. Little children are forgiving. They don't hold grudges. They don't plan revenge or payback. Shortly after whatever conflict might arise on the playground, they are playing together again without thinking anything of that former incident, that former event. I mean, it could have been 10 minutes ago that they had a almost a fight with the other boy on the playground or the other girl on the playground. And after they get through their pouting and their little fit that they threw about it, how long is it before they're playing again? It, it does not take long. Now, as adults, would we ever be playing with them again? Well, I'll tell you, I'm just never going to let them enjoy my company. I'm not. I'm, I'm never going to find myself in that situation again. You see how messed up we are. We hold that grudge. We hold that scorecard. We hold that however you want to phrase it. We're so far removed from how that little child acts. Forgiving. The third thing that we learned from that text, simple. Simple. They do not complicate things. They don't understand nuance or shades of gray. It's either black or white to a child. How, how much more difficult is it as an adult? Because we try to read all these 256 shades of gray between, well, I know they said that, but they, they twitched their eye at the wrong moment when they were talking or they, they turned or they coughed or, and I'm not sure what all that, all this junk, we're making up most of it. I mean, it wasn't even really real. And we focus on all this nuance and all the shades of gray and all this body language. Well, what do they really mean? And what do they really intend to say? I know what they said, but what do they actually mean behind that? All these ulterior motives. How much more simple would it be to just take people at their word and not try to read something into it? Another one from three through four there. Become teachable like a little child. Become teachable like a little child. So the next characteristic, teachable. Teachable. They're always learning, usually by asking questions. There's no concern about asking a stupid question. Have you ever realized that? Kids are going to ask. Little kids are going to just ask. Do they even care who they're asking the question of? Do they care about the credentials? Do they care about the experience? Do they care about whether or not this person can actually give them a good answer to that question? Does it matter? They're asking questions. Anybody can tell them anything and they will believe it as if it's true. Yeah. And I don't even know that they understand the concept of truth yet. It's more, 
I'm curious about the world. I'm curious about this new experience that I'm having. And each day is different. It's not, okay, I've already been here. I've already done this. I've already got that t-shirt. So I don't need to go here again. Uh, they, they forget from day to day, even what they learned the previous day. So they're going to learn it again. Now, I'm not saying that we should do that. I'm not saying that we should have to keep asking the same questions over and over again. But we've got to remain teachable. And we as adults decide, okay, now I'm only going to receive my information from so-and-so person or so-and-so with this degree or so-and-so in this status. How many times has God spoken to you through somebody, even a little kid, and given you an answer to a question and you're like, whoa, where did that come from? And how many times along those lines have we not been receptive to the vessel through which the question was answered and ignored that we even received the answer because it didn't match our standard of what the vessel was supposed to be. I mean, Balaam had to hear it from a donkey. Do you think he was expecting to have a revelation at the expense of the mouth of the donkey? Quite a trip. Yeah. How many of us would have been really messed up that day? What do you mean, a donkey talking to me? How, how, who do you think you are? I don't have to listen to no donkey. Some people think that way about other people. Yes, they yes. Exactly the That's exactly my point. We define who gets the opportunity to speak into our lives. We define who gets the opportunity to answer our questions, whether we know they're answering our questions or not, whether they know we asked the question or not. Children aren't like that. And we need to return to this former state where we realize God can speak through anybody at any time. The real question is, are you listening? Or have you dismissed his ability to speak in that situation because you've dismissed the vessel? More from three through four here. Take the lowly position of this child. Whoever continually humbles himself to be like this little child. Whoever meeketh himself as this little child. Now, that's an interesting word. Whoever meeketh himself. Now, that's a word you use every every day in casual conversation. I'm going to meeketh myself. And then the weast. Now, this one's, this one's a mouthful. Uh, Therefore, he who is of such a nature as to humble himself like this little child, esteeming himself small in so much as he is so, thus thinking truly and because truly, therefore humbly of himself. That is a mouthful. I'm going to have to, I had to read that several times before I actually caught that. Let's, let's break this down a little bit. He who is of such a nature. So he's talking about your nature. And then the next phrase, the nature is to humble himself like a little child. So that's what he's saying. He who humbles himself, who has this general characteristic about them, to humble himself like a little child, that person will esteem himself small because he is small. Now, I'm not saying you think little of yourself, but I am saying you have no right to think of yourself any better than anybody else. And we get messed up when we start thinking, well, I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to do this because I'm better than you. Because I'm more educated than you, because I live in a better community than you, because I drive a better car than you, because I'm the right color, because I'm the right this, that, that fill in the blank. Yes, I'm, I'm better informed. I can do better research. What are you doing in that place? Are you esteeming yourself high or are you esteeming yourself low? And when you esteem yourself highly, what does that mean? You can't tell me anything. It's prideful. And what comes with pride? You're setting yourself up for a fall. So if you esteem yourself small, because you really are small when you really realize it, then you will be thinking truly about yourself. And because you think truly of yourself, you're going to think more humbly of yourself. You see how the circle kind of repeats? If you think more of yourself than you really should be thinking, then you look for things to support your thinking. You look for things to support, to validate that opinion of yourself. Well, I'm better than you because of this. And you start listing all the items. I don't have to listen to you because of these things. And you start listing all the stuff. 
But if you thought yourself smaller, then you would begin to validate that position. Okay, I'm here. I don't necessarily agree with your opinion, but you're entitled to have your opinion. So let's discuss it. Let's talk that through. I may be wrong. You may be wrong. I don't know. Let's talk about it. A lot different than I don't have to listen to you. Have we grown up to the point where we have made ourselves worse than we should have and labeled it success, labeled it maturity, labeled it experience, labeled it whatever, because we've gotten away from these childlike characteristics? So the next characteristic, humble or meek? Humble or meek? You need to realize that little children at that time in this setting had no social standing whatsoever. It was worse than women. I mean, they had nothing. It wasn't until they became, went through their bar mitzvah and they were, they were 13-ish or something that they even counted in that culture and in that society. Little children were unaware that social standing was something to seek. Wouldn't that complicate, wouldn't that simplify our lives a little bit? If we had no pursuit, no knowledge of what social standing meant, we just did what we do. We just were who we were. Doesn't really matter who I'm trying to please, who I'm trying to get me to view me favorably. It doesn't matter how many followers I have on this and none of that matters. They had no social standing. They didn't even, they weren't even aware of social standing. It didn't pertain to them. How much cleaner would our lives be? Not from a sin perspective, but just simple and less complicated and, and more simplistic and, and easier even if we had no awareness of social standing. If we weren't always trying to keep up with the Joneses in whatever the Joneses were doing. They were content to just be loved by their parents. One of the lessons here is to give up our quest for standing and to just be loved by our father. Wouldn't that make life a lot better? I'm going to give up all the pursuit for all this other stuff that doesn't even really amount to anything and just pursue being loved by my father. This is about all I can pull from this Matthew 18 uh, text. So there's just some other things we're going to talk about in general, about kids and their characteristics uh, and some of the desirable qualities that I observed as I was thinking about this of little children. I, I might have missed some, but anyway, we'll, we'll go through the list and we'll see what we've got to say. Innocent. Little children are innocent. They don't know what or whom to fear or be suspicious of. They're not even aware that they're supposed to be afraid of certain people. They're not even aware that they're supposed to be suspicious of certain people or certain activities or certain behaviors. They don't understand subtlety or deception. Totally innocent. What happens to us as adults? That innocence gets lost and we get jaded. We go from, I'm not even aware of this, to everybody is out to get me. Everybody is, has got an angle here. Everybody's trying to take or to steal or to manipulate. Everybody's trying to do it. And do you see how there's bondage on both sides? But this is not nearly as fun as that. I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to ever be taken advantage of. Really? Is God not big enough to fix that problem? If so, you don't serve the same God that I serve. Because he's able to take all things that you do and all things that happen to you and make them work out for your good. That's, he's, that's something he's promised to do if we let him do it. But we're bound and determined. I'm not ever going to find myself in that situation. I'm not going to give him the opportunity to fix this thing because I'm not going to let myself even go there. Not an improvement. We didn't grow up. We didn't advance. Our way is not better than this innocence perspective. Honest. Little children are honest. 
They have no filter. It makes no difference to them what others might think about what they're about to say. So much so that they don't even think about it. Have you ever had one of your little kids and you, you find somebody in a restaurant and they've got some issue going on or whatever. And the little kid's with you and I, mommy, daddy, pop up. Why are they? And they they'll just double. And you're like, oh. Now, again, I'm not saying that we need to resort to being tactless. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying the mentality of what does it hurt to ask the question? Why, are, why would I be concerned about them being offended when I just want to know why? They don't direct their conversation by, well, I can't say this because they might be offended, and I can't say this because they might be offended, and I can't say this because I'm going to get thrown in Facebook jail. Uh, I, and all this other stuff that we have to deal with now as adults, rather than just honesty. Now, I'm not saying that, that we don't need that filter. But at, at least the thought process of uh, what is going on here? Why is this happening? Why can't we talk about this? Why, why can't we discuss? They haven't learned flattery or verbal manipulation yet. Wouldn't that simplify things? Oh, they do learn it young, and, and, and it's getting younger and younger all the time. And that's our fault. Because we tell them, we, we present to them, we allow them to think that once you get past that, that's good because now you're an adult. And what Jesus is saying is, no, that's bad. You need to drop all your adult junk and go back to the way those were as little children. They don't say one thing while meaning something else. How young did you learn that skill? You see that when you do that, there's no truth in what you're saying. If something, if you can phrase something in such a way that you lead people to believe something that you know is not true, you're lying. That is not a truthful conversation. That is not a, that's not something that the kingdom can get behind because there's not 100% truth in it. And just because you know something to be true, does that mean you go blab it everywhere? No, I'm not saying that either. That's the other extreme of this. Is sometimes you need to keep your mouth shut, even though you know something about this deal, because it you telling the next person isn't going to help anything. What does the Bible say to do that situation? Go to your brother and talk to them about it. And if you two can work it out, great. If you can't, take two others with you and go talk to them again. And then the third part, if they won't hear them, then take you to the church and let the church decide. Now, I've never seen that transpire. I've never seen that happen. But I'm going to suggest that as we get closer and closer and closer to the coming of Jesus, and as the glory on the earth gets turned up, we're going to see those things happen more and more and more frequently. And it's going to freak some people out the first time they do start happening. I'll just say this. Uh, I believe we're going to see Ananias and Sapphira again. again. Ananias and Sapphira. The two people that lied about the offering and dropped dead in the church service. Don't you know that's going to mess up a church service? <laughs> <laughs> Why aren't we seeing that sort of stuff? And, and the answer is really the glory is not high enough yet. We don't like that passage. We don't understand that passage. We don't, you know, we don't go there. But as the glory on the earth starts rising, as, as we get into this revival, this awakening, as we get into it more and more, and God starts doing more and more things quicker and quicker, the glory level starts rising. You're going to see that stuff again. Don't be, all the good things too. You can't have one without the other. The glory brings healings. The glory brings deliverance. The glory brings signs and wonders. Yes, yes, bring all that stuff on. The glory brings salvation. But the glory also brings more sudden judgment. Just get ready. Choose now whether you want to be part of that or not. I want you to think about the biggest sour push you know. Hopefully they're not in this room. <laughs> the biggest sour push that you know. What if you could go back in time to when they were two or three years old? Would they be like that then? 
Probably not. What happened? The world, lack of paying attention to this about returning, continuing to be like little children. In many ways, maturity is a negative thing. Think about what Mr. Grumpy would look like at that age. At that age, Mr. Grumpy was a dancer. He was a dancer. It doesn't matter what church or religion those little ones attend or are affiliated with. When the music starts playing, what do little kids do? They dance. Try to stop them. Try to, try to make them be still once the music starts playing. They start dancing. Where did we lose that? Where did that become inappropriate? Do those little kids care at all whether their dance looks good? Whether their dance is fashionable, for lack of a better term, whether their dance is choreographed, whether their dance, whether they know the dance moves. Do any of them actually believe that they can't dance? Or do they even think about that? But as adults, it's perfectly acceptable for us to use as an excuse. Well, I can't dance. Really? I've said it. I've done it. I, that's my mentality most of the time. I, I can't do that. Really? I'm wrong. I've got to make an adjustment. I've got to make a tweak. I've got to make a course correction in my life. Are they worried about their dancing being a sensual dance? Are we worried sometimes about our dancing being a being perceived as being a sensual dance? So we don't do it. So we stop. And to that, I would say they're dancing being sensual. Really? Have you ever seen a little kid dancing and thought anything sensual or evil or provocative or anything about a, a little kid dancing. <laughs> they don't even know what that is. They don't know what that means. They, they have no concept of, well, is that dance sensual? Are you trying to elicit some sort of a response? In some, no. They hear music and they're dancing. They're responding to their environment. I shouldn't dance today because this church doesn't believe in dancing. Do they care? Do little kids care if this church believes in dancing or not? Do they go through the tenets of faith before they start dancing when they turn the radio on? Why do we? These little ones believe in dancing. It doesn't matter what church they go to. It doesn't matter what religion. They believe in dancing because that's just part of who they are. Start the music and see how long it takes for them to start dancing. And they are having fun while they do it. Are we supposed to be like this? Yes. Can we change to be like this again? <laughs> Mr. Grumpy at three years old laughs and laughs a lot laughs everything is funny to a little child some researchers did a study they found that the average five-year-old laughs 113 times per day do the math on that and you have four or five times each hour well sure little kids could laugh about that because they don't know about taxes they don't know about marriage they don't have my boss man so they can keep laughing like that once we find out about those things we must quit laughing because of them really who said where is it written in the bible that thou shalt stop laughing when you come to the awareness of taxes when you come to the aware awareness that that marriage is hard sometimes when you come to the awareness that sometimes you disagree with your boss 
How much power do we give people in things like that, like the taxes, like the boss, like the marriage, about our own emotional health and choosing not to laugh? Well, I don't want them to think, who's power? Who's got the power there? Kids don't care. Little kids do not care. They don't know about all of the complications associated with all that stuff. They don't understand. It is. You're going to read that verse in just a second. Yes, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> that same study showed that by the time those children turned 44, they were down to laughing only 11 times per day or once every two hours. I know people, and you probably do too, hopefully you're not one of them, that aren't even getting their 11 per day. It's been a long time since they laughed. Really laughed, not a, a worked up, not a manipulated, not a forced thing, but really laughed. The verse that Carla mentioned, Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart is excellent medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Did you know that it's becoming increasingly common for doctors to prescribe laughter? Where did they get that? I wonder if that's part of the reason that our culture is so sickly these days. Because we all got grown up and we stopped laughing. We, we, we put too much emphasis on the things that take us away from laughter. Too much seriousness. Go ahead. Again, I don't want to complicate things that way. In trying to relearn things and, and you know, give, up, give up the old behaviors, it's finding what you laugh at. I mean, you know, you can laugh at some pretty, you know, have a, if you have a very sensitive sense of humor, you'll laugh at some pretty hard stuff. Right. And um, that's not healthy. I just know that uh, I tell you what, bad dad jokes are fantastic. Yes. <laughs> yes. And they're so stupid, they're funny. So um, I just I just know this is more speaking for myself. It's just finding what to laugh at, you know, and relearning just to not laugh at the dirty jokes. You know, I'm sorry, I grow up. I love dirty jokes, bad, terrible jokes. And, you know, you give that up. And you start telling these horrific bad bad jokes to your friends. They're like, there's no laughter there for them. I laugh at it because I just think they're hilarious. Right. But it's just on how find is what you're laughing at, you know. And I mean, I, I know this kind of deviating from what you're saying. No, it is, it's saying the same thing. We're learning a different behavior. Well, yeah. You, you grow up and you think, okay, now I, me and my maturity, me and my wisdom, me and my development have decided that what was funny before is no longer funny. So now I've got to press the boundaries right. before I can even make it funny. We've got to change. And you can find, you can find it not very innocent jokes. And, and, you know, that's something. That's why, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I love, I love to be like that. Did you know that laughter is an alternative to crying? You can pretty easily change a laugh, I'm sorry, change a cry into a laugh. Have you ever tried to do that? I, I've been in places before and I got charley horses. I mean, I had my leg up over a, a thing one time and I got a charley horse in the back of my leg. Oh, it hurt. Uh, there was another time I got one. I was trying to get out of the back seat of a car at lunch. And I got a Charlie horse in there. And it hurts so bad. I wanted to cry. But I started laughing instead of crying. I, I forced that change. Why? Laughing is a more spiritual response mm -hmm. than crying. Laughter immediately introduces this concept of medicine and health and healing into your body.
Yeah. 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 Y
we're doing that 20 seconds and you guys are already starting to get into it. I had a friend who did that and she'd do it in groups. She'd just start laughing and then three of us would laugh and we're on the whole room. And do you see how it's contagious? What should our response be when all this stuff threatens to come against us? Laugh. And people are going to think you're crazy. People are going to think you're, who cares? Do kids care? Whether you think that they're laughing at things that are really funny or not, does that stop them from laughing? The whole point here is for us to get back to the way that they were. The whole point of this lesson is to get back to the way that they think, the way they did you do certain things. Laugh. I dare you. This week when you're having a bad day, just intend, just force yourself. I'm going to just start laughing. What are you laughing about? It makes no difference to you. I'm not laughing for your benefit. I, I don't care what you think about me. I don't, I don't say the stuff I do. I don't do the stuff I do for your benefit. I don't care about your acceptance. I don't care about whether or not you like me, whether you think me. I, I don't care. All those other things are childlike attributes too. I, I don't care what you think. I'm doing this for me. I'm doing this to change my attitude. I'm doing this to release the power of God. The joy of the Lord, which is your strength. I'm doing this with the intent of releasing spiritual forces into the situation that can't be changed. I dare you this week to try it. To try to just laugh. To force yourself to laugh and see how long before that situation, at least in your mind, changes completely. Is anything different in the natural? Maybe, maybe not. Who, who cares? You'll feel better about it. It does. So this class with all these sick people would get up one by one and start trying to tell who they were and what they had going on in their life. And the class would just start laughing. Eventually the person speaking would start laughing. Many of them ended up being healed just because they sat and laughed for a little while. They had no more terminal illness. They had no more sickness. They had no more disease as a result of them just laughing laughing at themselves, laughing at this calamity, laughing at the, the supposed power of this thing to take you out. Laugh. Act like a little kid and laugh. But that's not funny, says who? And why does it have to be funny for me to laugh? But Eddie, that's just not me. Fine, stay sick. <laughs> You choose. I don't care. But remember, you used to be that way. What changed? If we could visit you as a two-year-old, as a three-year-old, you were a laughing dude all the time about anything and everything. What changed? And I submit to you that a lot of what has changed has not been an improvement. The next characteristic, they don't worry. They don't worry. Have you ever seen a little boy sitting in the sandbox and he put his head between his hands and he's just not having a good day and he's not playing. He's just, you can tell that there's something going on with him. And you go over and ask him, okay, what's, what's up, Bobby? What, why are you not playing with your toys? What, what's happening to you? And he looks up at you and in the most serious of all tones says, have you seen the price of gasoline? <laughs> Do you have any idea what it's going to cost for a college education when I get there? Have you ever seen it happen? Why not? Do they even, are they even aware of the concept of the cost of gasoline? Are they even aware about college and that I'm going to have to go there one day? Maybe I have to go there one day. And people have to pay for that stuff. They don't worry. They don't get bent out of shape about it. It's not their problem. We used to be carefree like that. We used to not have a worry in the world. And then we grew up. And we didn't make an improvement. 
Do you know the Bible forbids us from worrying? If you are a believer and you are worrying, according to the Bible, you are sinning. Hmm? You, you could go to uh, Matthew 6 or Luke 12, either one. And it talks about that and there are others. I'll give you some homework. You can look up the verse. <laughs> Uh, yes, she did. Yes, she did. Touche. Wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> right. And he had him bring um, him a TV. Right. And, and funny videos. Uh, Laurel and Hardy. Laurel and Hardy, yeah. yeah. Well, yep. Really Multiple it. times. Sure, now, we don't view this worry thing that seriously because it's part of growing up, right? It does no good. It, it does no good, but it's sin. Yeah. It is sin for the believer to be worried. And yet we don't view that as something that we need to repent from. Something that we need to turn from. Kids don't worry. Little kids in, in particular do not worry. We need to get back to that. That's good. And I, I, I told this, I told this to a, a couple of co-workers. Um, I need to be more bold to share with all my co-workers, but I told two of them, like, yes, this, this is going to be interesting. You know, the change is going to be interesting to say the least, but it's going to be okay. We're going to be okay. What's going to, what has God changed since this has been brought up? Right. <laughs> yeah. And he has it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I don't like even saying these words. Yes, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a, a change. Maybe God will make it smooth. I don't know. I just know with my company, things change, change, things don't always go smooth. But God yeah. can do that if he wants to go that way. That's that's part or of most it, companies. I'm gonna it, guess. It, my attitude towards it, like, yeah, I'm glad you're right. working 12, 14 hours until you get this figured out. Right. But you're going to be okay. So, but he, 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 he corrected my words. Before it could take root. Before, while it was still forming. Yes, yes. And now, when everybody's, you know, stressing about this, I'm like, you know, yeah, I don't know where I'm going to land. Still, or like anything. And I truly don't care. I, I, I'm going to rephrase that. I don't worry about it. I mean, maybe I don't know. So I don't know. I'm looking at where I'm going to land. You're walking in so long. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bidding process. I have six people ahead of me. Before <laughs> I even get the bid. That's awesome. I don't care. <laughs> That's awesome. Praise we, God. That's where that. It, it, it was a mind shift. It was a mind change. Yeah. 
And that's what we're talking about here. That's what we're, we're talking about today. Um, we somehow think that worry is connected to being responsible. Being responsible has nothing to do with being afraid or with worrying. If you boil it down, worrying is really a subtle form of pride because you think you have some control over it anyway. And when and the truth of the matter is, most of the time, you don't have any control over it whatsoever. If it happens, there's probably not anything you could have done to prevent it from happening. If it doesn't happen, that probably had nothing to do with you doing something anyway. It's a form of pride. You need to realize that I can't control this anyway. So why worry? Be like the little kid and don't worry at all. Next thing, little children have fun. People who are depressed and sour all the time are poor witnesses of the kingdom. There are people who are currently not Christians who think they don't want to be one because they have relatives that are. And if being a Christian means acting like Mr. So-and-so or Aunt Sally, I don't want any part of that. Because they're always mad, they're always upset, they're always depressed, they're always very sour, very moody, very critical. And if that's Christianity, I don't want any part of that. This is kind of an interesting one. No fear of germs. No fear of germs. Now, have you seen little kids pick the cookie off the floor, let the dog lick it, and then put it in their mouth? And we just cringe as adults. We just, what are you doing? Are they concerned? Do they have any concept of, now I am not saying stop washing your hands. I am not saying at all we need to uh, just throw our food all over the floor and all over the table, and I'm not saying that at all. I am saying we should have no fear about what we eat or what we touch. Ask God to bless it. Ask God to sanctify it. Do what you know to do, but it shouldn't be a fear-based activity. We should not fear germs do you realize in this room right now there's enough germs to kill every one of us multiple times over we're breathing it all the time to kill us multiple times dead what's kept us alive the grace of god our immune system the, the grace of god the power of god so why would that power not be sufficient if you were taking reasonable precautions and i'm not saying do anything dumb I'm saying do not live with this fear driving you and motivating you and, and making all of your decisions for you because little kids don't have that fear. And most of the time, they're fine. Fear sells. People purchase fear. It's a consumer item. It's a commodity. Little kids have no problem receiving. No problem receiving. You extend a popsicle their direction, do they care who offered it? Where they have come from, where they have been, where that popsicle has been, do they care about the motives behind the person offering it? What do they do when the popsicles offer their direction? They take it. And how long is it before that thing is eaten? Not long. They don't wait. How many people, how many adults have trouble receiving from God or from other people because they think they don't deserve it or because they think that that person, they're going to owe them something at the end of this deal? <clears throat> It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Have you ever considered that our refusal to receive is denying our Father the pleasure that he deserves? Related to receiving is the fact that little children don't hide their impression. You give them something nice that they really wanted. When they open it, do they calmly say, thank you, I appreciate that very much. 
You give them something that they really want and they think is awesome, what do they do? Yay, look at this, look at this. Yay. It's not masked. It's not concealed. It's not hidden. They don't try to filter their enthusiasm, their excitement about what you just gave them. And as adults, we think somehow it's it's more mature. It's more sophisticated. Well, thank you very much for that. I appreciate that very much. And we get to deny the person giving the gift the fullness of our enthusiastic response. Those little kids, when they get something that they like, they want to show it to anyone who will and even those who don't want to listen to them show it to them. As adults, we often try to hide our enthusiasm of, or how much it impressed us. Why? Where did this come from? Why can't we just be real like the little kids are about that stuff? What extra bonus points do we get by being so sophisticated in our responses? Little kids have no envy. No envy. As parents, we try to often spend the same amount or have exactly the same number of presents or both for each kid at Christmas and on their birthdays because we want to be fair. Did you realize that little kids don't think about it that way? Well, my mother always did that. So right. It was one birthday and I had three sons. She'd give everybody something. Not yes. They get the birthday. But they got used to that. Then if it didn't happen, yeah, they were disappointed. But that's odd. <laughs> but the little kids aren't going to count how many presents their older brother or sister gets. They're not going to count how much money was spent on the little, on the presents that they received versus the presents that the older ones received. In fact, the little ones oftentimes are more interested in the box you put the present in than in the present itself. There's no envy there. They're not saying, well, why didn't you do this for me like you did for them? They are joyed. They are thrilled with whatever it is that they received. And they want to start playing with it right away. They want you to drop everything else and put that together so they can start playing with it right away. And we're not even done opening the rest of the gift shit. Wait, wait, just a minute. put it together. I want to play it. They're enthusiastic. They're not envious. A couple more and we'll get out of here. Focus on the now. Little children, focus on the now. How frequently do we miss what is happening now because we're thinking about the past or what might happen in the future? Little children really only grasp the concept of now. They don't know that our past can have a bearing on our present or that it has a bearing on our present. They are thinking about the future, are they thinking about the future? Not really. Do they base their, their decisions on what this is going to cost me tomorrow, what this is going to do for me tomorrow? Not really. Everything they know about, everything they want, everything they're concerned about is now. We need to realize that we can't do anything about our past. We can't go back and change it. We can't go back and undo it. And you might be able to make amends. You might be able to start a process of restoration. But even then, most of the time, that's a, that's a God event. That's a God-inspired, God-assisted thing. You really can't do anything about what happened in the past. And you really can't control what happens tomorrow. The only thing you've got to play with is now. If you want a different tomorrow, what do you have to do? You have to make a decision, a choice to be different now. And then just expect that that thing will have ramifications at some point in the future. But the only thing you can really change is now. Little kids only focus on the now. And I'm not saying we ignore the future, but I'm saying the only tool that you really have in your play box is now. And last but not least, 
little children are helpless. Do you realize that the only thing that they're really good at doing is getting help? I mean, they can't do anything. They can't open the water bottle. They can't turn the sink on at the faucet. They can't get something out of the refrigerator. They can't do anything for themselves. But they become very skilled at getting somebody to help them. And they may, they may pester you. They may bug you. They may keep going at it until you help them. But they become very skilled at getting you to help them. Completely dependent upon somebody helping them. As adults, we pride ourselves on our independence. Well, I don't need anybody. I'm a self-made man, really. What if God charged you for the air you breathe? What if God charged you for your heart to keep beating? You're not a self-made person. You had some help, whether you acknowledge it or not. Somebody did something for you. And we pride ourselves on how independent we are. And what God wants is for us to be completely dependent upon him, just like we once were. Just like we were at one point in our lives, completely dependent upon those in our lives. God wants us to return to that. He wants us to do nothing on our own, but completely depend upon him. At one point in time, we were really good at this. Now it makes us uncomfortable to be completely dependent. And it shouldn't make us uncomfortable. Unless we change and become like little children, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. I've got some changes I've got to make. I've got some things I need to adjust. I've got some things I need to reevaluate, to reprioritize. How about you? Do you want to become great in the kingdom? The simple plan to do that is to go back to what you used to be many, many years ago. The greatest in the kingdom.